Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be on the planet. This is World Smart, a podcast of the Aaron Fox Schiff Law Firm. We are your hosts and International Practice Group co chairs. I am Hunter Carter. And I'm Malcolm McNeil. And we'll be talking with you with our partners and special guests about topics of interest in the law of the international business and business related communities. Well, hello, Malcolm. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Hunter. How have you been doing this last month? Things are terrific. It's September in New York. The activity level is through the roof. Very excited on a number of international fronts and particularly excited about our recording today. We have a terrific guest. Would you like to introduce him to our listeners? I sure will. It'll be my pleasure and honor. We have with us Anastasius Tassos Economou, who happens to be chief executive of his own company, which is known as iGroup. And he is also the chairman emeritus of the YPO, the global version of the YPO. Good morning, Tassos. And good afternoon or something like that. We're on different parts of the planet today. <laughs> I think listeners have already heard us say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, because they're all over the place. So that's good. All greetings are accepted. Well, Tassos, first of all, it's great having you here. We're very, very happy you made time to join us here at World Smart. We've given you a little bit of a background, and our listeners know what we do. We have these meetings with our friends, colleagues, business associates, general counsel, other business leaders, and you were referred to us, and we were very, very happy to get acquainted. And rather than get right into to your bio, I wanted to focus on one issue, and that is that when I was reading the bio, I was, I was quite impressed with the fact that you are the YPO Chairman Emeritus. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? How did you get involved in the YPO? It looks like you accelerated on the ladder, and now as Chairman Emeritus, it looks like you put a good portion of your career into the YPO. Tell us a little bit about it and how it's impacted you. So absolutely. I'll start by saying that I got involved like most things that are important in my life through fortuitous circumstances or what at the time appeared as an accident. Now, I had heard from YPO when I was starting my career from, at the time, the CEO of Burger King. He was raving about it, but, you know, being young and naive, I thought, you know, I don't have time for this. I'm super busy running my business. Fast forward to basically 2005, I ended up attending one of the YPO events and literally I was blown away with the level of conversation, the level of experience and the idea exchange happening. And you know, when you run a business, it does tend to get lonely at the top and having the ability to see that the problems that I was facing were not unique, but irrespective of industry, and this is interesting, and irrespective of country, very similar problems. You know, how do you scale? How do you find the right people? Financing issues, issues dealing with corruption at times. So a lot of the things that plague businessmen are actually similar the world round. The YPO, I think, is fascinating in that that, you know, numbers are numbers, $9 trillion of combined turnover, 22 million employees, 146 countries. But what I think makes it so fascinating is the perspective that comes from having an organization with such a footprint and from basically ensuring that you have the decision makers at all levels participating themselves. And the fact that YPO basically builds a great network of trust where you can actually open up and have that idea exchange in a safe environment. So I value these, I treasure these. And again, by accident, I got involved into the leadership because when I joined, I was in a new chapter that was starting. So in my first meeting was, welcome to YPO, your events chair. So it was very interesting because I was like, that's fantastic. I've never been to an event, but now I'm events chair, right? And then one thing led to another great friends. And I definitely have a condition and an ability to say no, and I get passionate. But it has really been perhaps the most rewarding thing that I've done in my life. It has allowed me to make friends around the world. And literally now there's no place in the world that I go to that I do not have friends. And through that and building of these friendships, some amazing businesses have come together. But interesting in the order, I first made friends and as a byproduct, we did good business. 
I think that's very, very valuable because I'm past president of the International Association of Young Lawyers, and it was the same thing. You met in a social environment, but did your hard work, but at the same time, you developed collaborative friendships, which were what made you remember everybody, as they say, on the reverse side of your card. Well, that's fascinating. Also, I tell everybody, you're a volunteer until you volunteer, right? Once you volunteer, you've got a job to do. Hunter, would you like to kick it off with a follow-up question? Sure. Thanks. You know, what fascinates me, Tassos, about the level of your commitment to IPO is the reach of the organization, the number of members that it has and everything else. Imagine that was probably a bit daunting at first. But for our listeners who don't know IPO, where is it, say, most active in the world? But also, where are you looking to grow it? Where would you like to draw more attention and gain more members from CEOs? In particular, not just geographically, but are there kinds of CEOs, sectors, or whatever that YPO has been focusing on for its growth? So the YPO started in 1950 in the US. So by definition, it was the first market and not by chance. It is the world's largest economy and an extremely pro-business friendly environment. So that's where YPO started. Currently today, if we fast forward to 2022, about 46, 47% of our members are in the US. The remainder are global. If I look at areas that we're looking to grow, obviously Africa is one. But apart from the obvious, what we are finding is more mature economies, such as perhaps Japan, Germany, or France, are actually underrepresented for the relevant size and importance in the world economy. And these are areas that we have worked in, we have improved dramatically, including places like Germany, right? And the idea is, when we look to grow, we don't look to grow for the sake of growing. And that's interesting. You know, YPO doesn't need to grow. But what we are doing is we are looking to basically represent the global economy. So it's like a microcosm of the world economy. But what is even more important is to actually find people who not only meet our success criteria in terms of, you know, turnover, employees, age, you need to have done it, but more importantly, also share the same values. So what I like to say to people is your level of business success is a necessary but not sufficient condition. I was watching one of the programs on the YPO website with a couple of fintech entrepreneurs from Africa. And I thought it was just fascinating to see these very dynamic young men who are really, you know, at the leading edge of the thought curve and putting their commitment behind their businesses, but talking to each other, really benefiting from gaining what they could from each other. You know, I guess a global organization like this inherently lives a certain kind of what we call DNI diversity and inclusion. How much of a priority is it to you as a leader of YPO to try to generate that, to help to contribute to that within the organization? And how does it help YPO to enhance diversity? What kinds of diversity have really helped the organization? It's huge. And the reason why it's huge is even when you look at your business, if you're trying to do more of the same, you can become better, you can become best in class, but that doesn't really move the needle. You're constantly marginally improving what's already out there. If you really want to bring novel thought into your business, you do benefit from doing just that. And I'll give an example. If you actually look at the way innovation happens, there's this myth that innovation is about an aha moment. You wake up and suddenly you have this brilliant, great idea. The reality, if we look at innovation, is that innovation usually comes across as people who take technology that's already available, but bring it together in a novel way. To give you an example, if we look at autonomous driving and electric cars, take Tesla. What Tesla did is it basically assembled together technology that was available in batteries, motors, lidars, GPS, and just combined it and compiled it in a different way to come up with the autonomous or electric vehicles in the beginning and now moving into autonomous mobility. So where people benefit a lot in YPO is by basically having that and having other disciplines and other industries exchange ideas as to what's happening. And then you can perhaps take something that works in another industry, apply it in yours, And in your industry, it will appear as something super novel that nobody's doing. Yet in another industry, this is the modus operandi. So it is huge. And diversity doesn't only come, I think, in terms of sector or business. It also comes with culture and mindset, things that work, things that you perhaps may have missed upon, and opportunity to do something differently. I'm glad that you focus on innovation. I saw a great line the other day. I was just trying to find it here who said it. Innovation takes inspiration. You need inspiration for innovation. And it sounds like that's exactly the point you're making about having folks around you that inspire you. Let's pivot to talk a little bit about your business. How has being in YPO inspired you to innovate in your businesses? 
Listen, I think it's huge, if only because I have so many intelligent people next to me that are doing wonderful things that you need to do something to feel you're, you know, you're part of the group. But a lot of things that we have done and I pride myself is in actually listening and applying some of these things. So if I look at, at COVID, a lot of the things that came out of the interaction was there would be a lot of money coming in and being distributed basically to help us go past COVID and help businesses that went through tough times. And if I look at what we're doing at iGrow Venture Partners, we basically looked at what was happening in terms of the European Union and distribution of you know the three quarters of a trillion that they're distributing in countries. And we thought there's a better way of the European Union spending money instead of just doing it directly through subsidies to basically create fund structures where they co-invest with investors. That aligns interest, which is critically important. The taxpayer is highly likely to get their money back plus a return. And you get that same job creation and perhaps even more durable job creation because it's likely to stay there after the subsidy expires. And that's how we went about into setting up the iGrow fund to do just that and invest you know, in technologies and novel ideas coming in and create that ecosystem. So there's many things that come around. And if you kind of see certain things applied in one geography, you can then think and apply them in another. So the benefit is constant and I thrive and I'm very lucky to be part of such stimuli all the time. So Hygro is a principally European VC fund, would you say? Correct, correct, correct. Uh, investing in technology in Europe and also in the US, because let's face it, the US has some tremendous ideas these days. What's the cutting edge for startups that VCs want to fund in Europe? Interestingly, I'd say it's no different to what is happening in the US. I think the difference between Europe and the US is that VC in the US tends to be, I'd say, mostly 98, 99% US focused because there's so much opportunity. Whereas when it comes to Europe, you start thinking cross country. So you're more likely to be looking in the Scandies, in France, in the UK, and basically doing what? Finding also business models that tend to be more international and scale more internationally. So if you combine the two, and that's what we're trying to do at, at iGrow, basically either get U.S. ideas that are working and bring them to the rest of the world or take ideas from the rest of the world and bring them into the U.S., it kind of gives you an opportunity to do something different and create value that many times in the U.S. is not the focus simply because of the way the market is formed and shaped. Is the strongest sector right now, say, fintech? Or what would you say is the strongest sector that you're looking at? I think fintech is very strong. We're starting to see a lot in artificial intelligence and how that feeds into quantum computing. Remember, we are, I was talking to Jack Hiddery, the CEO of Sandbox AQ. We're, in his words, two years away from actually having a working quantum computer. That said, just writing the code to interact with a quantum computer is expensive and takes time. So you have companies like Mercedes-Benz already doing it and working on perhaps solutions for the new generation of batteries that will change mobility, right? So there's a lot happening on that front and what that means. FinTech is definitely right now making a very big difference because basically it's making a lot of the trades far more efficient. I think that banks have a role to play in funding and in investment banking, but not necessarily many of the transactions that they're doing. There are now far easier ways of doing it. And especially if I start looking at the integration of Africa and mobile and the importance of that, I think sooner rather than later, this is happening. We're seeing in China where you basically have mobility having taken over. It's coming in the US and Europe. So yeah, fintech is definitely something that I think will go strong. I'll come over to you. I was going to ask a question because I work with VCs. We're in California on my end of the practice and we deal with Silicon Valley. And I was curious to know a little bit about what you're experiencing with what they refer to as the deal flow. Are you out there aggressively going after the deals and looking for opportunities or are people banging on the door looking for money? I guess I know what's happening here a bit, but I'd like to know from your perspective what the difference is, if any, between in the US and Europe in terms of how that process gets started. Yeah, so a few things have changed. Let me start by some similarities and some things that are global. It's a fact with interest rates rising and liquidity coming out of the system that indeed now it's becoming more of a venture capital market rather than a founder market. I mean, even if you look at valuations of big fintechs like Klarna going from mid 40 billion to about six and a half and repricing for a round. So that is definitely happening simply because liquidity that was abundant and basically almost free 
is now out of the system. Therefore, people are paying more attention to where their money is going into. And therefore, by definition, there seems to be an increase in the appetite of founders coming with more reasonable deals. So I'm not saying and I'm not seeing that there's more innovation. Innovation and founders and new ideas are you know, the way they always were, young and, and nice and vibrant. What has changed is where you can really cut a meaningful deal and what the terms are. If I go one step further than that, and something that we're seeing more in Europe and, and depends on the markets, is once you look in the US, say, East Coast and West Coast, or you start looking perhaps at Israel, or you start looking at certain market segments, they're very crowded, right? And what that does is it beats prices up. Even in the US, if you're looking in mid-America, it's not as crowded. So I think the difference is overall, the next two years, I think are going to be very good for VCs that have the money to find good companies and enter with attractive terms. And on top of that, I always say, try and look at markets that are not too crowded. When was iGroup formed? Back in 2007. Are you primarily a company that provides capital or do you go the other way around or is it a combination? So we provide capital, but I think that capital is a resource that was super abundant. It will always be available. And I think if you really want to make a difference, you need to provide more than capital. And where we pride ourselves, if you look at founders of our companies, such as Impact or Moniz or a few of the deals we've done, you will see that what we tend to do is add a lot of value. We like to sit on the boards. We like to help with strategy. We like to open doors. And part of how we invest is we look at the sector. We decide if we want to be in that sector. We decide if we want to be in a particular company. But one of the things we really do is before we make an investment, we make sure that we can add concrete value, whether it is opening doors to close contracts, whether it is bringing in talent that's necessary. And I think that perfectly aligns our interests with the founder's interests and allows for a good relationship to evolve, bearing in mind that it's never a straight line. And I have as yet to see an investment that was just rosy all the time. I heard one person put it, identifying practical synergies. Does that sort of put it in a phrase? Absolutely. Absolutely. So as a lawyer, we're hearing all kinds of opportunities arising, for example, in cryptocurrency. We talked a little bit about that the last time. Cannabis, our firm is making a great push on the metaverse. And I'd be very curious to know, we're one of the pioneers, if not the pioneer for service firms, law firms in getting into the metaverse. I just came back from Singapore and we participated, our firm, in a presentation to the lawyers on the metaverse. Do you have any opinions or impressions? about where the metaverse is going to take us over the next five years. Yeah, I do. And here's the interesting thing. I may not exactly know, but with a relative degree of accuracy in terms of probabilities, here's what we do know. As social media came along, a lot of people have come online, they're interacting. I think the metaverse is the next iteration because it really allows you to build more than just a social profile online. And I think where it starts getting interesting, it's not just social, but it allows enterprise to come on board. So it really is creating a second life, a new different different avatar or persona. So I think given human nature, the metaverse is going to continue growing. We may not be able to predict the exact pace, but it's happening. And if you have a 10-year horizon, you don't know if it's going to be year two, four, five, but it doesn't really make a difference because the transformation is so big that even return-wise, so long as you can stay the course and you've identified companies that can actually navigate the metaverse, you're going to do tremendously well. I think you guys are absolutely right and positioned spot on in terms of being there and being pioneers and helping people really navigate that because it's not easy. I love that answer because I ended with everybody was asking, what about this and what about that? What's going to happen in five or 10 years? And I said, I can't quite answer that question, but I will tell you this, don't ignore it. So that was my concluding remark. How about a little bit more on your impressions of cryptocurrency as an investment and the cryptocurrency realm as an investment, not just cryptocurrency itself, but the infrastructure around it. Any impressions on that? 
Absolutely. I think it's a very interesting area. And let me start with big picture. Crypto to me today is pretty much like railways a hundred and something years ago or the internet in maybe 20, 25 years ago. Meaning to say the technology is here to stay and it will make a big difference and it is making a big difference in the way we operate. What is not clear and is very hard to predict is who the winners are going to be. Right? And people try to do that with the rail lines and especially when it came to the internet, which is living memory. I'm sure you remember a company called America Online it used to be huge in the 90s. Right. But again, you don't know who the winners are going to be with crypto. But here are some interesting things that I think about crypto and why I think crypto is here to stay. First of all, what people are trying to do since way back when is to find something to retain their value. Right. Uh, it used to be gold before gold. It used to be pebbles. It used to be many things in history. And always humans have this propensity to find something that can store value and then be used as a means of exchange. Where I think crypto is very interesting, if you look at it, is it basically does that. And it does that in a non centralized manner, which is important. Why? For anything to have value and act as a great store of value, it needs to be something that you cannot start producing too much of if there is a change in price. So if you look at fiat currencies, governments can turn on the production of it overnight and double or treble or quadruple the stock of cash. And we've seen that in history happen several times. If you look at gold, gold is physical. And if I look at the US in the 30s, basically all of the gold was collected, brought into the Federal Reserve. And six months later, Basically, the value of people's holdings were halved as the exchange of dollar gold was allowed to basically half, right? So when people go ahead and look in this environment, right, of high inflation, of a lot of government intervention, they try and look of a store of value. Crypto can serve as that. The hard thing with crypto is given the complexity, given the lack of transparency and regulation, is which crypto is the right one. Right. And which one is the company that's there to stay? By far right now, Bitcoin seems to have a head start in basically saying it's an independent platform. It is a good store of value because it's very hard for new crypto to come. It's so energy devouring that it's very hard to ramp up that production in response to a shock, which is why it is likely to maintain some of its value. Is there going to be turbulence? Absolutely. But there has to be some form of crypto going forward that will survive, not necessarily as a mean of exchange, but as a store of value. And I think fintechs will come on that basis of whatever the winner is and start creating different platforms to facilitate a lot of exchange. I was going to say one last question on the cryptocurrency question, and that is what do you see as being the primary, let's say, exchange mode for cryptocurrency in the future? Is it going to replace traditional banking? Is it going to be something that is used in e-commerce? Is it going to be, let's say, identical to, analogous to, or somewhat similar to, let's say, national currencies? What do you see as its growth trajectory if you are looking at uh, corollary industries in crypto? cryptocurrency to invest in? So I think it's going to be a layered approach. The number one function that I think crypto will answer is store of value, right? Pretty much like you had gold in the past. So you need to have something that has a value. That I think is going to be the first layer. On top of this layer, there's going to be a layer where you might want to develop far more flexible platforms. And again, I'll use Bitcoin as many people are aware of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not conducive to a lot of transactions per minute, right? And if you look at the number of transactions that the Visa or a MasterCard are processing, you cannot do that via Bitcoin. But what you could do is use this as a base of store of value, link it to another instrument, and then use that as a mode of carrying out transactions. I do believe that when we talk about crypto, you're talking about blockchain technology. I definitely think that's the future, not just in trading, but in many other things when it comes to enterprising, tracking product. But also when you look at places like Africa or other places where you have a lot of donor money going left, right, and center, having this transparency of basically being able to track where everything is going and who's getting what is huge. So I think it's multi-layered. If I were to pick and the way I would look at who the winners are going to be is identify those strata. What does a platform need to store good value? 
the platform that meets most of these requirements is going to be the winner. Then what does it take for a platform to be efficient in processing payments? Great. Which platforms meets these, right? The transparency, the fast, the accuracy. Then go one layer on which platform provides the information that's needed in trade, like origination. Imagine now when we're dealing with sanctions, right? And oil and energy. Having a blockchain that kind of shows who produced it, where it went, the refinery, so you wouldn't perhaps get Indian products that have come from Russia being labeled as Indian, you could much more easily track that through the blockchain. So once you have, and I've given three layers, right, of blockchain and crypto that are valuable, you just look at what is it that we're trying to solve for, and then which company in the space is ticking most of these boxes. Thank you, Tassas. Hunter, why don't you jump in? I see you chomping at the bit to ask a few questions. Go ahead. I have been, but I've been enjoying the conversation. Tassas, as I listen to you guys, one thing I'm, of course, a lawyer, so I'm thinking about is what's the role of the law in all of this? And so, for example, back to the metaverse for a second, one of the real dicey questions in the metaverse space is legal recourse. What legal recourse does someone have if their NFT gets stolen or misused or taken cross-platform to another environment? You can't even identify the user necessarily, much less find where they're located and serve them in the old-fashioned way with a paper complaint demanding that they pay money as part of a lawsuit. Legal recourse needs to exist also, of course, in the blockchain environment. To some extent, you can, of course, do that. And governments have shown, including the United States Department of Justice, a remarkable amount of ability to claw back cryptocurrency transactions, for example, in ransomware cases or in connection with drug arrests and convictions. But those are the rare exceptions, really. How does a business owner like you protect your assets, protect your income stream while engaging in a blockchain-based business environment? And do you think about that? Are we yet to the point of blockchain penetration, say, in your shipping business, where you're also focused on how you'll get recourse either to recover for losses or to enforce obligations? Listen, I think this is where you guys have a lot to contribute. And when I think about the technology, I think the biggest impediment to the technology becoming mainstream right now is not the technology per se. There's a lot of programmers, a lot of things can happen. It is actually how do you get that technology, as you were saying, in a framework that actually works. And that requires a lot of legal work. And the hard thing is to find people that are actually understanding the technology and the legal framework to come together and where you guys can really help because only then can you really start solving for a lot of the problems. When I look at what is likely to happen, again, I I don't know, and nobody I think knows exactly how this pans out, but we can look back and see how it was handled in the past, right? And yes, it's very hard to find users and so on, but perhaps it could be the case that in a metaverse environment, you know, when you join or you sign up, there's a fee, there's a group or a pooling or a a central guarantee whereby you come in and you get the ability to go and claim against that if there is fraud or whatever. And remember, the beauty with the blockchain is even if you want to do that years later or months later, every transaction of everywhere where this has gone is actually written on that string, right? And if there's one reason why the U.S. government has been so successful with basically blocking transactions or reversing transactions is because it's there and you cannot alter that. So when they want to and they agree and they can go back, they can track it to the point in time that is of concern and work on it at that stage. So that is a huge advantage that you have in that metaverse blockchain universe. So if you combine the advantage of having that information there and you find ways whereby, you know, pretty much like we have guarantees in our deposits, right? You may get an actor failing, but at least there is the government coming in with a deposit guarantee. Similar, it could be government or not government. It could be Meta or another platform or the Metaverse platform saying, listen, I am setting up that guarantee up to, and these are the conditions, and that will build the trust. So it's taking steps of how we have solved similar issues in the past and building on them that I think is going to be the solution. Well, I do appreciate that you recognize that the lawyers who are, unlike me, really specialists in this area may have something to contribute because 
as I've walked through with what our firm is doing, having acquired space in the metaverse, space that we're going to build out, space that we're going to use for events, for meetings, for sharing of information, for the displaying of art, of discussions of trademarks. You know, there's a fascinating series. It's almost like going back to the first day in some ways, but in a new world for how, you know, even trademarks are being enforced or are being used. Your avatar may put on a pair of very unique sneakers. And the company that owns the trademark on those sneakers is going to say, but wait, you're now using my trademark and don't you have to pay me for that? And the response would be, no, if I bought a pair of the sneakers, I'm not using your trademark. That so-called first use doctrine is being litigated right now. But there's also issues where innovation is going to be needed, where if you have an NFT for art on the wall or a, you know an immersive presentation of some kind, and it's so attractive or so interesting that someone figures out how to hack it and it's used, it's borrowed, but in another platform, then the fact that you're in the platform where we bought metaverse space, like Decentraland, will be useless to you. You won't be able to enforce cross platform. So there's, I think, going to need to be some room for that. And also in the disclosure sector side of things, you know, uh, investors who are looking to maybe build out space in the metaverse or clothe your avatars and whatever else, there are going to be investors in those businesses who want to know what the risks are. But how's it going to work? And it's very hard, very early at this time uh, to say that. But I think that's also the exciting thing. I look at, Malcolm mentioned cannabis. I think if you had talked to people about the legalization of cannabis a few years ago, you'd have imagined something where users who smoke marijuana and buy it from an illegal distributor will now buy it from a legal distributor. But what in fact happened very differently is that a wide variety of new products for a wide variety of uses have been introduced. It's created an entire different ecosystem. Mobile telephony created not only communication, but personal access to lots of technological services. So when you look at all of that, I'm, I'm glad you see the role lawyers can try to play in innovating it. But let me put the question to you slightly differently. What do you want lawyers not to do? How do lawyers get in the way or how does the law in the current you know, real world get in the way that needs to be removed or refined as we move to a more metaverse type of platform? Yeah, listen, it's interesting because at times many people blame lawyers for a lot of things. You guys are complicating or you guys are not making the deal happen. But on the other hand, and at the same time, you're like, just make sure that nothing goes wrong. So on the one hand, you are tasked with basically covering every eventuality. But at the same time, you need to make it very simple, which is not necessarily easy because what you guys come across is basically trying to cover the unforeseen. And I think that skill set that you've honed over the years is going to be very relevant in the metaverse. And what I would like lawyers to do is at times, there needs to be some common sense in that, yes, many, many things will happen, but let us make sure that we cover 98% of the issue and we cover it solidly in a working manner. Because if you go for 100, well, 100 probably will end up being just don't transact. And then you're 100% covered, right? So in anything we do in life, even waking up, right? And opening that door and getting out in the street, you're taking risks. You don't know if you're going to come back. Now, we assume we always will, but you can have a heart attack. You can have an accident. You can have so many things that can go wrong, right? So yeah, we can try and factor everything in, but I think this is a fluid environment. A lot is changing. So I would say, let's go after the big picture and big issues that we need to start working and then start refining our way down. And I think this will be helped by the fact that pretty much in everything digital, size matters, acceptance of a platform. So yes, the metaverse is big, but I think sooner or later, it will, most of it, center around a small number of platforms, right? And we've seen that in mobile phones, it's iOS and Android and so on and so forth. So I do believe that, yes, there's many issues in the beginning, there will be tremendous number of platforms doing little things. And then as this matures, it will come together again to provide more of what is necessary for it to scale. So if lawyers basically along that way can kind of play along in terms of understanding, we're covering the important things, the things we don't know, but it is good enough for it to function and take it to the next stage. One quick last question on lawyers and stuff, and then we'll turn it over to Malcolm to wrap up. I wonder what Stepping back now from this topic and going just into your everyday business, the agro business, the businesses that you invest in, what is the number one legal headache that you face? Is it tax? Is it logistics? Is it enforcement of intellectual property rights? Tax, I think, is actually, believe it or not, one of the easiest because you factor in your calculations paying a little bit more and that's okay. The biggest problem that I have is when it comes to enforcing of operating contracts and how complex the various series tend to get with your anti-dilution rights and then who's coming in and layering 
one series on top of the other, different lawyers involved, and then it becomes very, very complicated, right? So at times, what we try and do in our investments is somewhere along the road is to kind of simplify the cap table because it tends to get very tedious and difficult. Toss us one last question. Malcolm and I are both international arbitration lawyers. We'd certainly benefit, as would our listeners, from hearing if you've had some experience with regard to the kinds of issues you just raised with international commercial arbitration. And if so, what's your feedback? For me, arbitration is a blessing. And it's a blessing because it actually allows you to solve issues in a shorter time frame. And mind you, you don't always get what you're looking for, but no is an answer. So the one thing that kills business and many people fail to see is even if you get a negative answer and it's done and you lose something, well, it's done and you can move on. What really we have found drags on and has been detrimental to a lot of businesses is that state of, well, we don't know, we're appealing and it's taking longer and basis what decision we get will then come back and revisit the business plan. So I think having an efficient arbitration where you can go in, there's clear stipulation as to how everything is adjudicated and what are the parameters and getting prompt responses, I think has tremendous value. I'll come over to you to wrap it up. I'm also fascinated by the conversation, and I was weaving it into one of the earliest comments that you made, Tassos, when you were talking about innovation, basically using existing technologies and knowledge and using it in a new way that benefits everyone, let's say. And Hunter touched on it a bit here. From a lawyer's perspective, what's tough, if I may, is that clients, they're usually in a hurry. They don't want to miss the train, the train of using that innovation to make a profitable and successful business. And what they hope to achieve, whether it's in the cannabis realm or cryptocurrency or the metaverse, everybody wants to immediately jump on it. And sometimes they avoid the risks or they ignore the risks. And yes, that's where we lawyers get the bad rap of being deal killers if we're pointing out, let's say, the downside. I've tried to navigate that myself with clients using that old phrase of the cost-benefit analysis. Let's analyze this. So with that in mind, and we also have a recent alert on the ag business and bioscience and how that's impacting agriculture, et cetera. Looking forward five years and setting aside what we've already talked about, what do you see or what do you foresee as the areas of most interest for innovation? What sector? What do you think is the growth area or what kind of a business would come to you that would seem interesting to you to explore further? Yeah, I'd say two areas. One is healthcare, because we are all human, we are finite. And no matter what we're doing, we will always have health issues. So anything addressing or improving health, whether it is, you know, the obvious cancer treatment, which has been around for so long, that's a big one, but also many of the autoimmune, many of the DNA related diseases. So anything to do with healthcare, I think is always going to be a priority because even if you're automating, even if digital is coming, you have physical human beings, they need to be healthy, they need to eat. And that is a reality that no matter how digital you go, you always have to address. And the second thing that we touched upon earlier on, I think is fintech and all this, you know, when you bring together the crypto, the metaverse, the the bringing together and how we are transacting in the physical and eventually in the metaverse, I think is something that is of interest. Why? We are at this particular point in time in history where the model is shifting and the institutions that have served us well until now, part of the role I think is becoming obsolete and is ready to be taken over by new technology. And I think they will pivot into core areas of lending and so on. So these are two areas that I think looking forward will be of interest for sure for the next five years. Excellent. And I'm going to throw you one last curveball, as we say in baseball, and that is, what is your impression of NFTs? You know, I have clients coming to me very skeptical and I have others that are very enthusiastic. And of course, we know that upsides and downsides, the upsides, it's creating a new market, which of course, for us lawyers is creating a whole host of issues that we have to advise clients on in terms of IP protections, protection for the asset, avoid forgeries, et cetera, et cetera. And the other side is, no, it's just a new art marketplace and it's something that people are going to be able to do to protect their investments and to have them protected on the chain. What are your thoughts? 
what I like to say is I think NFTs are neither good nor bad. It actually depends on the use. And the analogy I give is, you know, a knife. You can use a knife to clean food, prepare, or you can use a knife to take somebody's life, right? The knife itself is neither good nor bad. It's a tool, right? It is how we use it. And when it comes to NFTs, a lot will depend on how it's used. And I'm afraid to say, perhaps because it's so young, as a technology and uh, there's no guidelines and people don't really know how it works. It is far more ripe to abuse and it is happening. It's being abused for many reasons, for scams, for money laundering, perhaps for many of these negative reasons. But I strongly believe in NFTs. And I'll give you an example. Even when we look at the social component of that, you get an artist, right? The problem with most artists when they're alive is that they're alive meaning to say they can produce more works. And if you can produce more works, your supply goes up, so your price goes down. Therefore, you see that most of the artists actually really make money after they pass away, right? Which is not great for them. It's great for us in the art market, but not so good for the individual. Now, with NFTs, you can do a number of things. A, you can actually create a finite supply of something right? B, what you can do is unlike the past where an artist made a painting and let's say he was unknown in the beginning, sold it for a thousand dollars, 10 years down the road, it was worth 15. He only made that thousand dollars. Through the NFT and the blockchain, you can basically include code that allows them to make something in every iteration. And that is huge. And it's not just huge when we think of, you know, the US or Europe. It is huge when we start thinking of more remote areas where artists do not have access and they cannot make a living. This, I think, will transform art and artists and the ability of them to come across. The second thing that I think NFT does and is huge is right now, if you own an expensive artwork, you have to insure it. Very hard to transport it. You are terrified where you showcase it in case somebody burglars into your house and steals it. When I'm dealing with NFTs, imagine I take a Picasso, right? I have an NFT, which means I can take the technology with me wherever I am. I can project it and there's nothing to carry or be afraid of because I own it. It's in the NFT, but I can actually now start using that NFT wherever I am. And I think that second iteration, because now we think of NFTs as lousy JPEGs that you can see in a computer. But the kind of technology I've seen with projectors, with kind of 3D images and so on, suddenly it becomes far more interesting than a two-dimension painting. So I think the next iteration where actually NFT helps this art be with you wherever you want to be is going to be transformational. So there's something to be said in NFTs for what it does to the artists and the art market and kind of showing a lot of the problems of front running and so on because the blockchain will help but also in terms of use of art and how approachable and movable art becomes. So much like cryptocurrency itself, it has to evolve in terms of safety and security because those seem to be the two things that clients are the most interested in. And, and that's the consistency, I think, in the chain. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the big bet of the next decade. It's going to happen. The hard thing in this process is identifying winners. I think this is where you know the legal profession is going to be critical in terms of helping shape that. And I always want to reiterate that and say that to your listeners is try and think what the technology is solving for. And that is how you select winners in those areas. Stop looking at, oh, this company is great because it's amazing and it's doing great marketing, but actually ask that question behind that, which is, okay, what is the real need they're addressing? And why is it that this company is addressing it in a better way than anybody else? Well, I think that's a pretty good place to end on, which is why is our profession so important? So yes, Hunter, I think that with that in mind, I would say to you, Tassos, thank you so much for being with us. It's been illuminating. It's actually energizing. I mean, you're giving me a whole series of things to think about and some additional talking points and queries for clients. Hunter, you have any closing thoughts? No, Malcolm, I agree with you. I've been taking notes here throughout the conversation. I started by consulting my notes, but the conversation took such a lively turn on its own. And Tassos, we're just so grateful to you. I'm so glad that Richard Griffiths connected us. Your observations, your insights have been terrific, uh, not only for me and I'm sure Malcolm, but will be terrific for our listeners. Looking forward to staying in touch with you and seeing what you do next. I'm sure the sky's the limit. It's been a real pleasure, always there for you. It's really a pleasure to have this conversation and I hope I can always give some thoughts to many issues that we're all facing out there.